Hello there and welcome to this vlog of June 2022 and today's video will be even more ad hoc than usual in that I've been so busy this week I've not really had time to prepare anything like properly like I've not been able to really read anything or do any research or anything like that as much as I usually do anyway which usually constitutes about 45 to 60 minutes <laughs> like reading uh, through a book or um, something online or whatever. This isn't really a highbrow uh, channel where I'm doing lots of research. So, and I make no apology for that. This is very much like a talking head, um, like thought piece on certain topics surrounding Battletech. Uh, today's topic though is going to be like very, very like subjective and even, like I said, even less professional than usual in that not going to bring any notes or, you know, do any, um, like, copious amounts of evidencing what I'm talking about because I really want to just discuss why I love Battletech so much and why that's quite odd for a British person. Um, obviously, that's very, like, generalising. There are plenty of British people that love Battletech, but we are in a minority over here. Um, and I wanted to talk about a little bit why I think it resonates for British people and how, why it should be more popular over here, if that makes sense. Like, obviously, there are, it does have like a movement over here, there are people that play it, but I just feel like it's always the or has always been like the smaller brother to like Warhammer, um, which I think is a real shame because I think British people would really gravitate towards Battletech if they knew that it even existed. I'm, I'm, I'm not just talking about, like, uh, gaming people here. I'm talking about, like, you know, more geeky people in the populace who don't necessarily play tabletop games. But I think the, the whole, like, universe of Battletech is... There's a real British feel to it. Um, now, maybe that's just what I get out of it. I, you could equally say there's a very like Japanese feel to it as well because obviously all the oh, well a lot of the like mech designs come from Japan. You've got things like House Karita, so I I might just be looking at this completely like ethnocentrically and thinking or, or coming up with things that resonate with me because I come from the British culture. So it's it's a tough kind of circle to square is that, but I can only talk about my experiences and why I think. Um, Battletech is or should be really more prominent over here and I'm not going to go into any kind of technicalities on like marketing or game design or anything like that because I think they are what they are at this point in time you know the if you I, well, I'll put another way I'm not going to do like a compare and contrast with with Warhammer 40k because you know people like the Warhammer universe, which I like it as well. That's great. All power to you. I think, though, that, as I said, if Battletech could have had a little bit more of a push, like in the 80s and 90s in Britain, I think it would be a real, like, challenger to what Games Workshop are doing. And that would, therefore, make the, the industry a lot healthier because Games Workshop wouldn't have such, like, a monopoly or a... I suppose you could even go far as to say like a stranglehold on uh, on the tabletop market, and I think that would inherently make everything, uh, or make the the tabletop gaming a, a much healthier place where competition exists, and you know the companies would keep compete on prices and things like that. Whereas at the moment, obviously, Games Workshop are really in a league of their own and have been for so long. It's difficult for any other IP to really make traction. But again, I'm not. That's kind of a point aside. I mean, I may one day do a video on on something like that. But that's kind of the business uh, external stuff. What I'm going to talk about today is the actual things within that like BattleTech hierarchy that that really resonate with me, and why I think it's really quite like a special IP. Which obviously I think that because I talk about it for you know up to like an hour every week on this YouTube channel, and I at least spend probably like a dozen hours a week, like reading it or um, playing the tabletop. So it's got really quite a prominent place in my life, um, which is kind of strange because I fell out of it for so long and only came back to it like several years ago. 
And now I just can't imagine it not being in my life. Like, it's really quite important. And I'm still trying to kind of catch up with my own brain. Like, why Why is this so? What, like, really resonates to me about this particular setting, this particular IP? And I suppose the first thing to say, and again, not to veer off too much into the, like, outside of the Battletech universe, but I absolutely adore the tabletop game. I think it's especially classic Battletech. If you've watched me talk before about Battletech, you'll know that I kind of use like a hybrid system between Classic and Alpha Strike and, you know, I've got my own homebrew rules as well. But the actual like tabletop concept of Battletech and that like, even even like the micromanagement of like the mech damage and things like that, just, I don't know why it just really resonates with me. I don't know if it's because it's got like a very computer game feel to it and this is this was very much designed in like you know in them early days of, of computer games so maybe when i was a kid you know i mean i'm you know 39 now so i kind of came up with all those like early computers in the 80s so maybe i've got like a nostalgia thing for it on tabletop i'm guessing that is the case and it it always felt to me you know when you're filling in your little like uh, damage sheets and things like that it felt very much like a like a computer game tracker but what's kind of interesting to me is that that never like fell away as a novelty or something that I liked. I've heard people say that as well. I've heard people say things like, well, I actually prefer playing things like the Hairbrain Schemes Battletech game because it, it tracks all the damage for me, like basically across a turn-based game. And I don't have to like mess around working out, like, you know, what is my walk speed after a foot actuator gets damaged and stuff like that. It will just sort all that out for me you know in the back end or you know my leg butt gets blown off and then I've got to slow down that kind of thing and I think for me like the the micromanagement of it is very very fun on tabletop like it's it's really part of it that experience and because Battletech is not really a difficult game it's really quite simple you know I reckon you only have to play through it like three or four times to really kind of understand all the rules and they've kept that rule system for so long I mean they've had little tweaks to it here and there but generally speaking you can pick up like a you know a 1989 version of Battletech and it resonates like almost identical to like a, a copy of Total Warfare that you could pick up today that's obviously very beneficial that's been very beneficial for me because I've not had to come back into the gaming system and learn a whole new set of rules Everything about what I play, like, you know, on a on an evening with a friend will just remind me of playing like what I did when I was a kid because it's almost identical. Obviously, there are differences. You know, now I use 3D terrain. I use things like the Flex uh, record sheets, which are amazing. So, like, things have changed, but the structure of it has, has stayed very similar, so that helps. So, yeah, I think it... In a way, that massively increases my experience for it, especially with the kind of release of all the Catalyst uh, new plastic models as well, which has been just a, a wonderful time, really, to get back into Battletech properly while these Kickstarters have been ongoing. So it's, it just feels like there's a lot of synergy going on, and I'm just, like, along for the ride. So that's kind of the practical bit, what I'd say for the first instance. But what I really wanted to discuss uh, across this video was the... More towards like the the Battletech universe itself and the law, and I think the first big thing for me, and this is a, a huge thing, it's going to sound quite abstract though, but Battletech just feels so real, and I don't mean that as like you know some weirdy fantasy thing like ooh you know I want to be that no no I mean it like if you were just transported into the, the Battletech universe and you were just on some, I don't know, random planet in the Free Worlds League, it would just feel to me like you could go for a pizza. Now, I know that sounds like the most mundane of things, but it's so like, I don't know, there's something very enchanting about that, that even though this, that this time period is in our far future... It's like the technology level. I'm not talking about like the big powerful end stuff like, you know, uh, the mechs and the weaponry and stuff like that. Set that apart. 
I'm talking about the fact that they still seem to have like deep fat fryers, <laughs> whereas in a lot of sci-fi, it's like they have they feel like they have to cleanse all the bad habits of say like twentieth twenty first century life. The best example is Star Trek, where like you know medicine just seems so clean, and obviously that would be great. You know if you can just go into a like a doctor's office and they could be like nah, you've got slightly high cholesterol zap there you go and you've now not got high cholesterol obviously that would be lovely but i think we all know that the future probably won't be like that like i'm sure that there'll there'll be some things which they just like eradicate in terms of like if you want to talk about health or you know um diseases and things like that but i think ultimately speaking if you transported yourself a thousand years in the future even if say like human humanity kind of gets its act together and does things that are a little bit special and we don't end up in like the horrifying Mad Max version of, of reality. I'm pretty sure that like in a thousand years, people will still be eating, you know, cannelloni and curry and burgers and things like that. I just, it might be a very, very different version of them. And you kind of get that in Battletech as well. Like you'll have like planets where... It might be too expensive to like import meat, and for whatever reason, maybe something to do with the gravity, they can't like farm meat, so they have to eat I don't know like insect burgers or something like that, which is probably going to be our future as well, the way that like farming is going. So maybe get used to eating that. But what I'm trying to get at is like it, it just it never feels to me like within the Battletech universe that they alienate themselves from us as like human beings in in the time period where the game is is actually um being played which is obviously now it doesn't feel like they completely take us away from that and make it very abstract which you do get that across a lot of science fiction settings not that i really consider battletech a science fiction setting it's slightly science fictiony but you know it's more to me like geopolitics and obviously the it's all bound around the the fact that it's a tabletop game but that's a different subject entirely but it just it's it's like they took certain aspects of it and they made it quite like a high-end futurism but then the general populace are still kind of in those like mundane existences you know you will find like i don't know potato farmers in battletech and or in the battletech universe and i just think that there's a, there's something about that that just seems inherently real you know, I, I don't think that humanity will ever realistically be able to overcome all its uh, problems and issues and just, you know, be in a, a position where we have the uh, endless energy and endless, uh, you know, like, for want of a better term, like the Star Trek uh, replicators where you just go up to the, the box and say, I'll have a, you know, a milkshake, please, and there's your milkshake. I just, I don't think things like that will happen. And even if they do happen, it will only be like a very select group within the percentile of the population that will get access to that. Because as a species, we've just proven over and over again that we do, and I'm not, I don't mean this in some kind of weird political way. It's just a, I think it's it's true within history. If you, if you analyze history over like a prolonged period of time, there is always going to be like a power dynamic and a hierarchy in the, you know, in the, the human um, social experience. And we can rebel against that as much as we want. But ultimately, I think we are like genetically hardwired to do that. And Battletech, I think, is a very, for want of a better term, it's a very honest look at humanity. It's like we have this amazing technology and we do create something that's really quite like special in the Star League, but then it all collapses and it causes these horrendous wars and has people asking the question, was all that worth it because of all the death and destruction that came after it? So that, like I said, that reality within within the Star League, sorry, within the, the Battletech experience really, really resonates with me. I think it... I think when you like reading the books and the lore and the technical readouts as well, it's just ingrained in the entire IP, this notion that these people are, they're not removed from you. Just because they're born a thousand years in the future, you can still recognize 
all the flaws and the heroicism, of, I'm not sure if that's the word, the heroics um, of the people and what they're doing. And like I said, I think that's, it's just, it works for me on a, on a real, like, um, on a narrative level, for want of a better term, because when you're creating your own, like, games and even on tabletop, it's like even with like the lofty mech warriors, or even like when you get to the clans who are, they are about as far removed away from our society as you can get, it still feels like they're all, they're still us. And the clans are actually a very good example because if you kind of look at how the clans operate, there is a lot within clan culture that I think is just an outright lie. And what I mean by that is they will talk about their concepts of honour, but then they'll just kind of leave them at the door when they don't suit them. That's a very human thing to do. And if this was like real high-end sci-fi stuff, that wouldn't really happen. It's like that those characters would get their set criteria and, and they would be so like abstract and, you know, like removed from what we understand. And that's fine. I mean, some great sci-fi that does stuff like that. But Battletech really tends to always bring it back to the the point that humanity is selfish and greedy. And I like that, like, but it doesn't go too far. And I think that's where the, maybe the comparison with, with, um, with Warhammer or specifically 40k is actually quite a, an interesting one to do because I think Warhammer 40,000 does really kind of push over that boundary in that it's just, it's so like sprawling and huge. And yes, I mean, there are like, for instance, the Imperial Guard certainly resonate, you know, with like modern man. You know, they look almost like a military like ours and they're against all these like crazy odds. But when you've got like, when you've got things in that universe, either whether it's the aliens or the space marines who are basically not even human anyway, I, I find it very, very difficult to get any kind of like relationship with that IP. Like, I, I don't feel like I could go into the you know, the Warhammer 40k universe, um, not that it's somewhere you'd ever want to go because it's pretty horrendous, and go for a coffee. But I do feel that about Battletech. So I think that is, a that is I, I put that number one, like in terms of the talking points here, because I really do think that's hugely important for me personally. I'm not sure how other people feel about that. Maybe you've never thought about it in that context, but maybe now I've said it, you're like, huh, yeah, that's, that is actually something where... I feel that I, I can gravitate towards it. The second point, and I've touched on this a little bit when I was talking about the Star League, is I really, really love the history in Battletech. And not just the, I'm not just talking about the law history, which kind of goes from like, is it like 2020 when the kind of the technology really starts in the Battletech universe? And up to, you know, well, now they're in like 3150 or something like that. But for me, it would be, you know, as I've said many times, I really do kind of play that the eras between um, 3025 and 3067. So that, that like, that huge, like, chronology of all that thousand years of history that exists there, I really, I love that. I love how they've done that. I thought it's it's been really, like, thought about and well-written and it's well-researched. But what I love about it the most and most successful historical like it's weird how to say this because you're talking about past tense, but like historical game settings, it's our future, but it's their past, whatever. You know what I mean, I'm sure. I find it very interesting that or how the, the writers of it clearly knew their history and tied so much of our like real world history into Battletech history. And I think this some of this really resonates with people in Europe probably more than it does in the US are in the for quote unquote new world. And this is a really strange abstract thing. And if you're American or if you're like Australian, you'll probably be like, what? Like you, it might sound very odd to you, but when you live in a European country, and I, I when I say all this, I just to make clear, I'm not, this isn't meant as some patronizing, you know, talking down to thing. I In fact, I really, really get upset when, when Europeans do that. Um, to people like in America. So I don't mean it in any kind of patronising way at all. It's just something that we experience because of where we live. And that's the 
the real history that we feel in Europe. That say like in uh, the US, and I'm talking about the colonial US here. Obviously, America has incredible history, you know, with its native population. But a European being in like the US, that kind of journey really starts, you know, a few hundred years ago. Whereas for if you are a European and you're born in a European country, you have that history around you like everywhere. And, you know, whether it's like, um, I mean, for instance, I live quite near a city called York, which you probably have heard of. York's quite a famous city. And there are like buildings and things going on in York that, you know, go back thousands of years. And it's quite special you know when you're walking those streets it's like you feel the the footsteps of history that have been tread there now again i don't say that in a patronizing way because if you are american and you live in say boston boston's got a very rich history and a lot of most american cities do but i always feel like you know american cities if you look at how they are planned for instance i mean chicago for instance I mean, I've you know, if you go to Chicago, you can see how like well planned it is in terms of the you know the street streets and how Americans talk about things like blocks. We don't have that really in Europe. We've got these like really like old cities. Even our like relatively new cities are still pretty old. I mean, if you go and if you go somewhere like Edinburgh or um, you know, the Scottish cities, the Irish cities, or you know, it, London's obviously a very good example as well you will find like catacombs and you know like things going on under that city that just go back for millennia now why i'm saying this is because i think if you have if you have that european mindset when you reading something like battletech or whether you're reading like historic novels you live with that every day and it resonates there's something i don't know there's something ancient about what uh, about how we live in Europe. And I know for most Europeans, they won't feel that way. They won't, you know, it's not something that will be omnipresent from for them. But for me, as someone who really likes history, it really is. And I can like go out and explore like a few streets away from me and you you might find something like Roman there. I mean, or you might find like, as, as happens quite a lot in Britain, if you people who go around with uh, like metal detectors and, and discover like a Saxon gold hoard, or something that goes back like one and a half thousand years. And it's quite like, when you're living in that and you, you can appreciate it, it's really quite special. And I one thing that I love about Battletech is how they really like revere that, that history. And I'll talk about, I've kind of thought about one example to, to speak about when I'm, when I'm doing this vlog. And it's kind of how the Star League is viewed in... Battletech, and it's just so similar to like how we in Britain envisage the Romans. And if you know that as history, like if even wherever you wherever you live, if you're watching this, you you'll know what I'm going to say now because it's very very obvious that the Star League is the, the equivalent of the you know the ancient Rome within the the Battletech experience in that they have this like really phenomenal empire, but it's kind of built on sand to some extent it's like it's not able to last because it's still got that like model that's just flawed you know much as like in like ancient rome when augustus oops dropped my pen when augustus like formulated the um you know the the what became like the the empire of rome you've kind of got that a little bit within the the battletech experience with like the cameron dynasty and I always think that's like such a massive flaw across like the, the Battletech, which I think human beings would probably do something like that, where they're creating these like you know, pseudo monastic systems, uh, not monastic, sorry, um, monarchy systems, which are, you know, are even worse, like with the Karita, where they've got this like Japanese feudalism, or the Capellans, which take like some of the most awful like um, states in, in world history and, and define like a, an ethos or a creed around that and the clans do something very similar i don't doubt for a second that humanity would do that uh, if given half a chance especially where you've got like a power base that has to control like a huge population i'm sure they would come up with something really quite insane to try and keep those people under control and 
the Star League is, is really tragic, obviously, because as amazing as it was, and it was, I mean, if you kind of read the law on it, it's pretty phenomenal what they did and how they were able to unify everything. But at the top of it, there's still that, like, rotten apple of a dynasty who all it takes is like one bad leader to start making bad mistakes which is exactly what happened in the star league and it eats itself alive and it gives opportunities to people who are really quite horrendous and i think like again when you when you live in a country that's got you know like a thousands of years of history uh, behind it when you re when when you're kind of in the the BattleTech universe, and even if you're doing like Lost Tech hunts or something like that, you just get that because it's something like when I was a kid, we'd go, you know, I'd go walking up and down like Roman roads, um, which are not like I mean they call them Roman roads. I'm sure they've been like resurfaced, but it's still a road that was built by Rome um, to you know transport troops or whatever else and. You know, or you can, you can go to buildings where there are like like Roman aqueducts and bath, baths and things like that. And I just, that to me, that's like a real wonderful part of, of like the Battletech experience that I don't think many other like sci-fi um, things really do, at least that, that aren't like dystopian. And Battletech's not a dystopian like universe, really. It's, it's flagging. And it's stagnant, especially when you kind of get into the succession wars. But, and yes, they do like massively downgrade their technological and scientific base through all the um, the horrifying wars that occur after the fall of the Star League. But, you know, and, you, and obviously like out in the periphery as well, you will have those like Mad Max states. But generally speaking, like the inner sphere powers, like if you are born into like um, Davian or even certain... Uh, like periphery powers like the Taurians, you will have like probably very similar levels to like healthcare and state education that we have. Might be slightly more propagandized than what we have, but it's still going to be like pretty decent. So it's not just like society falls off a cliff. And that's something else I find very interesting about Battletech is that there is every different kind of society there. So you, if you do want to kind of experience the whole Mad Max people or pirates racing around on really, really cranky old mechs and bikes and cars, you will find that out in the periphery, absolutely. I mean, you'll find it in certain places in the inner sphere as well that are slightly more gung-ho and crazy than maybe the central power would want them to be. Or you can come across worlds where, you know, if you, for instance, go to New Avalon, where they'll have, like, probably like the cutting edge of, of science, especially at the end of the Succession Wars, where, and, you know, with, like, the rediscovery of the, Mel, uh, the Hell Memory Car, where technology starts making a comeback, there'll be certain worlds that really start to like push on, and the quality of life starts becoming like much much better. So you've got, it's just there's such like a huge um, variety of of things that you can experience there. And I think if you if you are within that sandbox, whether you're playing the games or you're writing uh, like narratives for it, which I'd love to do, you know, I love to write for my like mercenary outfit, then there's just so it's so rich there's so much to choose from and it's again i think going back to that historical thing because it ties back to our own history it's quite easy to understand if you know about our own history for instance like for me 3025 is such a cool era because it's like the renaissance and seeing that like occur seeing that like rather than it happening in like you know, the Italian states, though it happens in this like huge sprawling galaxy where you've got people actively trying to improve things by getting the technology. And, you know, much like the uh, the Renaissance um, artists and scientists did, where they, they rediscovered the, the classics and understood that the, the, or the, the wisdom within the like classical text that they were able to kind of take and, and make relevant again and you know beyond no illusion that was one of the things that created the modern world like without that i i genuinely think we'd probably still be living in like medieval times i mean that was that was like the spark that the the species needed really to get us back on track so and i'm not just talking about like western culture there it's like if you look at like for instance in the in the middle east and their mathematics system which was way in advance of uh like say like the roman system 
you know, the discovery of, of zero. I say discovery, I mean, there's a debate, isn't there? Is, is maths discovered or invented? Um, zero is something that, like, really changed how mathematics worked. And then it just opens doors to things that, or to, like, great minds who can then tap into that um, that theory or that, that new thing and start coming up with, like, new amazing inventions and, and things of that nature, which create what we have now so like when you've got that's why i really do love the 3025 era because it is very romantic it is it, you do feel like it's um you know like not not just renaissance within science and technology but also in like the evolution of society like i think that's really when they start to kind of question things like you know why are we living under these like pseudo um communist states or monarchies things like that and i think that's one thing that i i thought the hairbrain scheme game got really really good because that obviously all takes place in and around 30 25 when they've got like a state asking the questions of why can't we go back and have what we had before with all the the you know the the unified nature of our ancestors why can't we do that again why does there have to be perpetual war so it all ties together and i find that very interesting again from a, a a a real historical view but then within the setting itself the f next point i'm going to make is, is slightly tied to that but it's very very subjective to being british and that's just and i, I kind of touched on this already but just how much british and scottish influence particularly or scots irish influences in battletech which really, really resonates with me because I, um, uh, you know, I, I am British, but I lived in Scotland for quite a few years, went to university in Scotland. And Scotland's got like a real like special place in my heart. And when I was a kid, and it was before I went to live in Scotland, but I, I understood that, you know, like what the Star League was and the Camerons and things like that. But when I've kind of come back into Battletech, that's really kind of hit home just how much... Uh, like Celtic influence is on this, and that I'd love that. I mean, make you know, I'm not, I'm not, I can't put up any uh, facades on this. Like I do adore the fact that, like you know, you've got mechs like the Highlander, you've got things like you know, mercenary outfits who are like the Northwind uh, Highlanders who are like very very Scottish. You've got like, especially like through the Cameron dynasty, there is so much going on that kind of ties into those like Gaelic, um, like histories. And I think that is because I can't be sure, but I, I'm going to guess here. I don't really know much about like Battletech history um, when it comes to the, you know, the people that wrote it and things like that. I know some of the, the people involved, but it's not something I've really looked into. I get the impression that one of the, the leading writers was like a Canadian Scot. I could be wrong in that. It's definitely someone who has like Scottish lineage, which a lot of Americans have, have on it, obviously. But I just get the feeling that the, like the Camerons themselves, I think if I remember my law correctly, I think they do come from like the Scottish Canadian lineage. So that makes me think that someone's purposely done that. And that, Scottish feel it just resonates all throughout um you know all of Battletech I mean famously obviously they've got things like the Black Watch um, now the Black Watch are a real thing I don't know how much people know that uh, I've got a friend I mean the we've kind of changed our our like regimental system in Britain now so I think they've changed the name from the Black Watch now it's like the Scottish um something or I, I don't know the actual name but like I've, and I've not spoken to him in years, but if I ever did speak to him again, I'd be like, have you ever heard of Battletech? Just to, if he knows that he's like, you know, the regiment that he's attached to become these like uh, amazing warriors who go out on to f found this like, you know, I mean, they're, they're really important in the founding of like Clan Jade Falcon, for instance. And it's like, I, I love that about Battletech. It kind of ties into that first point of how real it feels. Like, you've got these, like, our military uh, institutions. And I think um, the uh, the Black Watch were, like, Cameron's house guards, almost. So they kind of become, like, a royal guard. But you've then got... It goes far beyond that. And quite famous, obviously. You've got things like our own, like, engineering um, and, like, 
things like General Motors are in Battletech, which I just love. I just love that like the, the people that made this IP were just like, yeah, well, they'll probably be around in a thousand years from now. And I always looked at it. I I think like now this is how I look at it anyway. I don't know if I looked at it when I was a kid. But I kind of suspect that they were uh, like in a position with the... Um, you know, like the, the those kind of factories where they were like, should, should we, shouldn't we, like, put them in there? And they obviously, like, pulled the trigger and decided to do it. And I think a lot of that comes from the um, the fact that that probably would happen. You know, like you probably would have, like, uh, these brands that were doing engineering stuff that would go forward in the future. But there's one real, like, caveat that I have to put on that when I talk about this. And that's that the 80s for Battletech went in a completely different direction to our 80s. That, to me, is where the like our universes like start to, to branch off. And they, they've got their parallel universe, we've got ours. For us, it was all about like IT and com- communications and, and communications technology. So out of the 80s, you had things like you know Microsoft, Apple, Nokia... Um, companies that went on to like completely define the world and a generation through like you know uh, uh, te- communications technology. For me, though, in the BattleTech universe, their parallel universe that they kind of spiraled off into was was like the same thing, but it was for like the uh, the car companies, so like Ford and Vauxhall and McLaren and Ferrari, like they were the ones that like defined the the populace and the generation. So mobile phones in Battletech, I'm sure that they existed in some like really uh, basic form. But in my mind, like in 30, I don't know, 3025, they've got like their equivalent of our like brick uh, Nokia's like from the 90s, because it wasn't anything that any like uh, company or corporation or government really gave that much credence to. Now I could be wrong in that. Like you might be like, oh well, actually they have really sophisticated uh, like handheld devices in, in BattleTech, and maybe they do. Maybe I've just forgotten. But I always like to think of it like outside of like things like the like the HPG network and things like these really elaborate like communication technologies that they've got through Comstar. Like the general man and woman in the street is still using like text messages because it's like they just went in a different avenue or a different direction and everything became centered on like, you know, faster than um, light speed, you know, travel, uh, jump ship technology, um, fusion engines, PPCs, you know, in terms of weaponry. And it's like like that's where the the species really like pushed and and tried to like excel. Things like you know like you know the, the old mobile phones and everything else was just an afterthought. It was like yeah, well, there's some niche companies doing that. So like Microsoft might still exist, uh, like in BattleTech, but it's kind of like a small little um, what what I'd call an SME, a, a small medium uh, enterprise. So you know. It, it's just how their society like progressed as opposed to ours, which went in a different direction. And that's something, I, again, I find very, very charming about it. The, the fact that they were able to really like give, it's, it's almost like a, a hand over time, right? Like they, they can like join up that we can, even though it's a fictional universe and a fictional setting set in a thousand years, we can still just see so much of our like, uh, like personalities in that as a as a species, it's just if you can get into the mindset and like suspend your disbelief and think, well, you know, our two like uh, human experiences diverged. You can, I think, you can absolutely buy into the fact that that the BattleTech thing actually happened. You know, like the universe as is with the Star League and everything else. Whereas I don't know what we'd have to do as a species to say, for instance, get to the Star Trek universe, like. I think we'd have to stop being human beings. And that's not been me, me being critical of Star Trek. I mean, I love like classic Star Trek and, and Next Generation Star Trek. But it, they, they're so removed from us. You know, like the, all this like, well, we don't really have selfishness and uh, crime and, and things like that. And, and you, I think that, I mean, I once had a really interesting, I, I don't know what it was. It's probably 
some kind of geeky thing online saying that actually there's a lot of like propaganda in Star Trek and like the Federation that, you know, I've, I've got this thing like, oh, everything's perfect, but actually underlying the, the civilization, there's quite a lot of like anger and, and frustration. And I can, I, I like that a little bit, but not too much because I think Star Trek is like a, it should be seen as like a glorification of how amazing the species can be if we set aside petty differences. And I think that's good. I think that as a, as a, an actual IP or they're like USP, you know, they're like unique selling um, thing for, for the general populace is we can do better. I, I like that. I love that little like um, quirk in Star Trek that makes everything friendly and happy. And it's somewhere I always thought with Star Trek, it's somewhere you'd love to live. You know, if you could live in like, um, you know, on Earth at that time period where like, they even control the weather. Like, yeah, it might be a bit boring, but you know for a fact that like your neighbour's not going hungry and going to be made homeless because they can't pay the rent because the human species have kind of got it together. So that's kind of one extreme. Of it. And then the other extreme of it is obviously like the majorly depressing, like, you know, despotic, horrifying um, dystopian universes that exist and I think Battletech just sits just beautifully in the middle of that there are things in it that are like really like inspirational and um, you, like humanity at its best that's how I put it but then on the you know on the uh, opposite of that you've got things that are pretty horrifying and terrifying and you can imagine human humanity getting into that place where they are basically nuking world after world for for no other reason than just we don't like our neighbors we can absolutely i think all imagine that that's how um a lot of states would deal with their problems so it's no different for, for battle tech but then you get things like you know the aries convention which puts a you know like uh, restrictions on warfare so it's like it's just it's like a, a a big check and balance system for me is battle tech like something lovely will happen and then something terrifying happens and it just it does that and it keeps things so interesting. Um, and I can't, I mean, that's it really. I mean, that's that's, that's what I wanted to discuss today. They, they are the, the main reasons why I, I really do have a, a special place in my heart for Battletech. Um, and just going back to what I said initially, I think it's it's something that I really do hope it, it takes off more in Britain. I think it's something where, because British people tend to be quite, the word is hit, like, there's almost a, um, I think British people like that kind of grounded, small, I don't want to say that Battletech's obviously huge, but it deals with like character driven, small scale things that I think resonate to British people when it comes to like art. Um, I'm not, again, I know that there's like a real operatic uh, element to, to, to Battletech, but it is very character driven. The stories are really kind of, um, you know, centered on, on individuals. Whereas I think if you're looking at things like, like I said, for like 40k, where you've got these like things like the emperor and the primarchs and it's, it all just seems so like abstract and lofty. And in a way the British people, you won't find like a more prof, um, profane people. Um, whether it comes to like, sport or music or culture it's like a lot of us pride ourselves on like that concept of the working classes i think battletech really really does that beautifully well uh, and i don't i don't mean this in any kind of classist way but like in middle in um like say middle america where um, and growing up where i grew up and i didn't know any americans growing up really but when i saw like how the middle classes lived in america it was just so much more affluent than than what I grew up in, and in a sense, it, it's it's just it's a weird like irony of of this history really that I think Games Workshop was spawned out of like satire, real satire as well. Like the orcs are like football hooligans, right? And if you know about British modern history, you'll know what I mean by that. And but mid, the Games Workshop always really marketed itself to middle classes. Whereas Battletech didn't. Battletech for me is like the ultimate like beer and pretzels game. It's like something that I can imagine like, you know, the lads in the factory playing, you know, because it's just so easy. Like, and there's no kind of restrictions on it. They specifically said in there, you don't need models. You can play with 
Coke bottle cans and uh, of tops if you want to. And we've got the you get the the map in the the box. So you don't need any elaborate three D terrain or anything like that. And it's just a weird thing. Like obviously for me, I always associate like that eighties America with like affluence and wealth. But BattleTech was seemed very working class. But then Britain, which was like we when we went through like Margaret Thatcher and we had the you know there was a lot of class warfare over here. There was a lot of like tension between um, so like the, the traditional working classes and the you know the people in power but our gaming system became this like massive middle class thing and now i think it it really should be time hopefully for for battletech to break through um because it's a complaint that i hear about games workshop all the time is that it's just getting too expensive um and battletech is still again it still keeps that ethos there is nothing in battletech that i find expensive i mean it's been Today's actually a good example. Uh, I actually went to Games Workshop today um, with this Battletech t-shirt on as well, by the way. So, bravery award for this gentleman. Um, and I went in there just with the intention of buying a couple of pots of paint. Walked out of there with like a bag full of stuff, right? And when I walked out of there, I thought, you know, that seemed to be slightly more expensive than usual, uh, and I went back when I got home, home I uh, like got my receipt out and I bought um, a Blood Bowl team. I bought the Norse Blood Bowl team and quite a few other things as well. But that was the, you know, the main thing that I bought. Now, I collected Blood Bowl last year. I went and bought like all the teams, painted them up. And the Norse is uh, a team that I actually had an interest in. So I, like I said, I was walking past the Games Workshop today and dropped in and got it. But... Last year, I, I got all the teams last year. They were about like £25 each or something like that. They're now like £32 each. So it's gone up like in six months. It's had like, I think it's like a £6.50, £7 increase uh, just for like one Blood Bowl team. And I'm like, how are they like getting away with this? I mean, to put it in context, and I've spent a hell of a lot of money on Battletech over the last few years. That's my own choice, obviously. I mean, that's... But when I when I look at what I get with like the BattleTech models, or the, you know like the miniatures, and and how and more importantly how many you need because you can literally just collect if you want to collect House Steiner, right? And you just want like you know you can do it. You can get like a company. No, you don't even need that really. But if you wanted to do it on a fairly decent level, you get twelve mechs for about sixty dollars, something like that. It's really, really cheap, is Battletech. Now, I completely go over the top. I mean, I've got, like, forces from every power. I collect different mercenary units. I've got my own mercenary unit where I'm getting up to, like, regimental level. So I plow, like, plow the equivalent of thousands of dollars into Battletech. And you you could argue that you can do... You, this Games Workshop is similar, but I think with Games Workshop, if you want, like, a starter set, it's going to cost you, like, 200 250 maybe $300 now. Which I'm, I looked at the prices and I'm like, how on earth has this spiraled into this? And why is that? And to me, it's quite obvious. It's because they're catering to a middle class audience who have got disposable income. I think Battletech has, has just got such a different ethos to that. And, you know, kudos to, to Tops and to Catalyst and to all the people who came before them. And they never really broke from that. And I just, that's why I said, I hope that people will start to cotton on to that when they are like in the hobby that the it's not just the um the game itself which is much much cheaper i mean you can you can buy into battletech for a pretty low amount of money and be able to operate at a pretty decent level but it really reflect reflects in its ip as well it really reflects in its in its the way that it's done like culturally and i'm i'm not going to get all politically correct about it but like just the representations that's in there and, and the one which really really like speaks to me is these like the female representation in battletech which is quite frankly light years ahead of its time i mean it was really kind of in the 80s where you know things like alien is the famous one with like sigourney weaver where you had this like you know five years before ridley scott did alien i don't think you could have like gone to a studio and said i oh, will have a a female protagonist she'll be the survivor so something obviously changed in in kind of how society was working at that time to to give that the push and then she became like pretty much one of the most iconic uh, like action heroes in history and 
obviously things have built on that as well like as things as time has gone on you see more like um like female representation in, in film it's like I said, it's still not perfect but it's definitely like higher than it, it was when I was a kid and I think people like Sigourney Weaver and Ridley Scott as well and people attached to that franchise were the ones that really laid the like the, the paving stones for that but Baltec like really just like in the mid 80s I mean the first real character in Battletech that I remember is Natasha Kerensky and she's like generally lauded as like the greatest like you know uh, mech warrior of all time and it's not just her either. I mean, you'd look at like that time period. You've got people like Katrina Steiner, Melissa Steiner, uh, just like an untold amount. I mean, it's pretty much like, as far as I can see, it's like gender gender equal in terms of the like protagonists and antagonists, and just things like that. It's always like coming back into it. It's really quite amazing to see like what they were doing back in the 80s when I, other ips look at like how games workshop marketed the um the space crews uh, space marines which still to this day causes like friction in the universe because obviously all the space marines are male all the primarchs are male that's kind of how the law was set down we don't have anything like that in battletech because it just got really really established early on yeah natasha kerensky she's the greatest mech warrior ever and i always think like it's it's almost like a lost ip is Battletech. I'm not talking about that's not firing any shots at the people currently involved in it. I think this has been something that in my mind it should be one of those IPs that rivals the you know the the likes of whether it's like Star Wars, Star Trek, things like that. Because it's so like all the things now that like a lot of the, the studios are getting criticized for because they're really trying to like hard sell um like for want of a better term like diversity or what we consider like modern diversity into ips which to me looks it just looks so crass and over corporatized i've got no problem with it whatsoever as long as it's done uh correctly and when by correctly i mean it's not it doesn't just look like um like a political move to score points with the like the the people watching it or so they can come out and get good PR on it, things like that. If, if you're going to do something like that, you know, do it correctly, do it properly. And there are plenty of films and TV that I've seen that do it correctly. But when it's done badly and in a crass manner, it just looks awful. And I think, I'll, I'll call it out for what it is, I think it's like an underhanded form of racism to some extent when you get people doing things like that. It's, it's pretty weird. And Battletech just has like nothing like that whatsoever this again i think it's so refreshing and especially from a you know like a 30 35 40 year old ip and the stories that are in there i think you could really kind of you you could commit them quite easily to film now and it would tick all the boxes that like the major studios are looking at especially if, if you're going to do a stories on you know like the capellans or the Carita, which have have got like a you know like a very like asian feel to them they are quite interesting uh, places as well because obviously in the early days and this does tie back to where Battletech is of its era in that the Capellas and the Crete were like the bad guys but then there was definitely a sea change for that in the 90s the clans came along and they were like the main antagonist and at that point then I think Crete and the Capellans really kind of got um, like a smoother run I mean to a point where I think the Capellans are just so interesting and are really kind of a you know they, they do get so marginalized and they are treated really quite badly by um you know, especially the fed comes and, and eventually fed com as well but just this like i said I, I love stuff like that in battle tech that i think would just resonate so much with like a modern audience it just needs to be out there you know and people need to 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 get it and pick up on it and i'm i feel like like really on the not I'm not saying I feel like I'm on the crest of the wave, but I feel like I'm riding that wave with all the other Battletech fans and being like, oh my God, this is... like It's almost like we've got like secret knowledge and it's just... It's such a, a wonderful, um, interesting... Whether it's the gaming system, the law, the history connect, um, connections that I've talked about and now it kind of connects to our real world. And it's just... I don't know. There's something just... I'm going to say this word, there's something magical about it that I think is 
is quite rare and if you are into it as well you know enjoy this because it's not something that's usual now i mean things are usually still like nostalgia driven i don't feel like nostalgia with battles like, i feel like i'm exploring something that's really quite like it's so new and so interesting and i really wanted to kind of commit this to to video just to talk about this because i think it's um it's just something that I think the Battletech community gets it, but I don't think we really vocalise it in just how wonderful it is to be a Battletech fan at the moment. So, anyway, I'll leave it on that positive note because uh, otherwise I'll end up rambling. But there you are. I hope you liked my little treatise on why Battletech is amazing and why I hope it becomes the premier gaming IP over the next five years, which I do think it has every chance of doing if the custodians of it play their cards right. Anyway, I'll leave it there, so I'll thank you very much for watching, and I'll hopefully catch you again next time.